What up, everybody? This is Stephen Breach coming to you here tonight. We're going to be talking all about WWE's 2015 SummerSlam. I got to pace myself because this is a pretty big show. We got 10 actual matches. Normally, when I sit down to do the previews, there's like six matches, um, maybe one pre show match or something like that. But for WWE to go to 10 matches, it's a really big deal. It reminds me of the SummerSlams and WrestleManias of the past. Um, you look at some of the old WrestleManias, and they got like 12. 13 matches on there. It's unbelievable. I know that when you go back and you watch a lot of those shows, the matches only last two, three minutes. And it's more or less just a way to get the guys on the card to have so many superstars to make it seem like it's a really, really big uh, deal. Uh, only a few of the matches would go a long way. But uh, WWE uh, bumped this year's uh, SummerSlam pay per view from three hours to four. Um, so this is a really big deal. You know, WWE is trying to build a new destination. Um, you know, WWE WrestleMania um, travel. You know, sort of a way to bring in another huge bulk of revenue to their summer. You know, they, they've always had WrestleMania. WrestleMania has always been a, uh, a must-see show. Uh, SummerSlam has been there. They've had some shows where it seems like the show really, really matters, and they've had some other ones that sort of fall a little flat because plans don't really go the way that they've done. Uh, this is the first year in uh, six years that WWE has moved SummerSlam out of the new... Uh, Summer, I'm sorry, SummerSlam out of the Los Angeles area. I was able to attend five of those SummerSlams there uh, from uh, SummerSlam 2010 to 2014. All of them, in my eyes, were great shows. I loved going down there, experiencing WrestleMania access. I've heard rumors of basically one of the main reasons why... WWE moved SummerSlam was they didn't want to have the destination uh, pay-per-views in California, both both of them on the West Coast, so they gave SummerSlam up to uh, New York. In my heart, I hope that SummerSlam comes back to Los Angeles. I felt that SummerSlam really felt um, like a part of LA. I thought that there was a way to you know sort of groove them into the community. Uh, SummerSlam did a whole lot of work. You know, when WWE would come, they would have. Um, press and they would have um, things like Make a Wish and trying to make the city better, um, you know, the reading clubs and things like that all throughout LA. And um, for the people that, that know about LA, they, they think about the Hollywood, the glitz and the glamour. There's a lot of places around Los Angeles that need a lot of help down there. And uh, WWE going there and, and doing it, uh, you know, the last time uh, WWE was in New York for a big show was WrestleMania 29 during the pre show um, opening segments, you know, WWE took credit uh, for cleaning up the uh, the shore uh, by bringing WrestleMania there. They were able to say that it was, you know, moving forward. Um, the big storm that they had there that wiped out the Jersey Shore was miraculously erased. <laughs> uh, I really thought they were going to try and do this again for WrestleMania 30, saying that, that they were the people that came down there and, and made New Orleans uh, a new place. But they ended up not going that direction. I think maybe they got a little bit of negative uh, things out of that, but... I really hope that SummerSlam comes back to L.A. Uh, I don't want to take it away. This year it's in Barclays Center, which is a, a new um, budding place uh, for WWE. You know, for so many years we thought of Madison Square Garden uh, being the home place of um, WWE for them running all of the house shows throughout the years and all of the real big shows. They've been, they've had previous WrestleManias and previous SummerSlams. And for a little while, I believe it, at first... Um, I believe it was the IZOD Center uh, was the first announced place where SummerSlam was going to be. And then I think they decided they were going to tear the IZOD Center down. Then they were fishing around trying to find some place to move SummerSlam to. I remember I was joking around like, no hard feelings. Just bring it on back to L.A. Uh, they ended up going with Barclays Center, which has basically replaced the uh, New York market. Uh, people say that Madison Square Garden is just too expensive to run uh, with renting the building, paying the unions, and everything that goes along with the live show. Um, it just makes more sense to go to Barclays Center. Barclays is a new arena, uh, the home of the new, uh, I guess they'd be the Brooklyn Nets. I was going to call them the new, new Jersey Nets, but they've uh, since dumped that name since moving out of New Jersey. Um they 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 tend to you know give a lot of the big places a little bit of a better deal in order to go there to fill up their center you know they're making money uh, WWE's making money it ends up being a good thing all around 
Um, SummerSlam, honestly, like I said, 10, uh, 10 matches. You got Rusev and Lana, Owens and Cesaro, Orton and Sheamus. You got the uh, triple threat for the IC. You got a four away for the uh, tag team belt. You got the Wyatts against the Shield. Um, Steve Amell, you know, the big celebrity coming in from the show Arrow is going to be wrestling in a tag match. Your Divas elimination tag, Cena versus Rollins, and of course your main event of Undertaker versus Brock. Definitely, uh, you got a little bit of the future here with a lot of the NXT girls as well as uh, Cesaro versus Owens. Um, both matches, you know, these people are going to be trying to, you know, make their spot in WWE and try and push forward and, and become a bigger star than they are. Um, you've got some guys that are established, Orton versus Sheamus, uh, Cena versus Rollins. Um, you know, there's there's things all throughout this card that make it really good, but I think all eyes are going to be on Under Undertaker versus Brock. Honestly, I think WWE was really surprised with the uh, the sort of uh, appeal that this match has. So I'm really looking forward to this one. It's going to be a good show. Sit down and relax. We're going to be talking about this one for a good while. Like I said, uh, this should be a a 16 part video talking all about WWE SummerSlam. So let's get to it. With WWE moving to more of a WrestleMania-like pace for SummerSlam, ESPN has picked up coverage of uh, WWE this week. And uh, this morning, we had Brock Lesnar appearing on a whole bunch of shows, Mike and Mike in the Morning, Sports Center, various podcasts. Anybody that had a chance to get Brock Lesnar on the air today, he was on the air. And you can remember back to uh, the week of WrestleMania 31, Brock Lesnar went to ESPN where he made his uh, announcement. He was going to be staying with WWE instead of going to UFC, which was a big story at the time. A lot of people thought he was going in, doing the job to Roman Reigns, and then we would never see him again. He would go fight against uh, some big opponent uh, for uh, UFC and make tons of money where he would finally hang it up. But uh, I think Brock Lesnar is looking at the future, seeing that maybe if he goes to UFC, maybe he's able to get one more fight before it's exposed that his body is beaten down and is not to a UFC pace anymore. Um, Brock decided to stay where he, you know, wrestles a few times, makes a few appearances, makes a big time check from Vince McMahon. Um, and, uh, all, all was done. You know, today he was on there and, uh, he was asked about Dana White saying that professional wrestling is fake. He basically said that uh, wrestling is fake. Everybody knows that. But, uh, you know, Dana White and uh, Vince McMahon both basically do the same job promoting fights. Uh, he feels that, you know, Vince McMahon has been in the game longer. And um, he just is going to be able to do it. Uh, you know, I think this all got kicked off by an employee of uh, ESPN, a former uh, employee of Vince McMahon and WWE, none other than the coach, Jonathan Coachman, an ESPN, um, I guess you can say he's a sports center anchor is, is what his title is. I think it was him thinking out of the box, basically saying that, um, you know, ESPN needs to be covering SummerSlam. They need to be a part of the show. Um, I, I think there was a little... Thing that last year he was trying to get this, this off the ground, uh, especially with ESPN, um, you know, having LA locations where they cover the Clippers, where they cover the Dodgers, the Angels. Um, you know, LA is a big sports town and, and they have their own um, sports center, which is uh, kicked off on the late show because basically it just works out better to, to be working on that time slot. And there's a lot of the ESPN personalities that are there. Uh, it ends up being that uh, it wasn't off the ground, but this year um, we saw a big change with ESPN doing coverage. Uh, to WrestleMania 31, they showed Daniel Bryan winning the Intercontinental Championship. They showed John Cena winning the United States Championship. They showed Seth Rollins cashing in and winning the WWE World Heavyweight Championship, where they had to explain what the Money in the Bank briefcase was, which was a, a little bit, you know, weird. But uh, I think they wanted to get the, the the point over that somebody beat Brock Lesnar, and this was a big deal. But um, ESPN is going to be doing live coverage from Barclays Center. Um, with Jonathan Coachman being there Sunday morning from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., uh, they're going to be doing, um, you, know, you know, stories that pop up throughout the day. Um, probably talking to Brock, probably talking to Undertaker, John Cena, The Miz, a lot of the the, the big time stars at WWE that do a lot of media will probably be getting interviewed, talking about how big of a show this is, and then right before. Um, the show starts from 6 to 7. They'll be doing another update. I'm sure after the show is over, we're going to be getting a wrap-up as well as some, some coverage to get there. Um, it's a little bit funny for ESPN to be jumping on board with WWE. I know that uh, you know SmackDown and Monday Night Raw do bring a lot of ratings. Um, but uh, when, when, the, when, the, when the deal was up, 
for them to, to sign a television deal. Vince McMahon was talking up about basically, you know, getting big time uh, television rights for Monday Night Raw and for SmackDown. Uh, there was rumors that Fox Sports One, ESPN, USA, Spike TV, um, lots of these big uh, television networks would be bidding uh, to try and bring Raw in, to try and get those wrestling ratings that were there. And at the end of the day, um, you know, they got a little bit of a raise, but there was no ESPN money because ESPN didn't bid. I guess it costs less to get the coverage of it. Maybe WWE even gives them the tapes, just saying, hey, if you get a chance, put these on. Maybe they don't have to pay for the uh, the coverage. But uh, um, there's talk about maybe ESPN going after UFC when their deal comes up. So um, they're trying to bridge out. They're trying to get a lot of ratings. They're trying to get more people caring about ESPN, who is the number one name in sports. But the thing is, with so many people cutting the cord of cable, um, there's less money out there for them to be making when it all comes down to it. But WWE uh, getting covered by ESPN is a big deal. So th big thanks to Jonathan Coachman. And uh, hopefully they even find a way to get this guy worked into on being on the show. All right, this one worries me a little bit because it doesn't really make a lot of sense. WWE announced that Jon Stewart will be the host of WWE SummerSlam 2015. I know that there's been an ongoing storyline of Jon Stewart versus Seth Rollins that dates back uh, for a little while. Seth Rollins has been on Comedy Central's Daily Show twice, both making uh, surprise appearances, sneaking up behind Jon Stewart as Jon Stewart was trash-talking him. This, a lot like with the ESPN coverage, is a big deal for WWE. You know, being a part of pop culture, bring, 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 uh, being brought up uh, on this uh, you know news show uh, that that has a, a Monday through Friday schedule, a large amount of people watch this. John Stewart was the host of this. Uh, for a long time. I think he did 16 years with The Daily Show. He just recently retired. You would think with the retirement, he would be you know, going off and enjoying, um, not really having much responsibility, not really having to do much of anything, but taking a booking to show up at WrestleMania, oh, I guess it's a SummerSlam, I apologize, is a pretty big deal uh, for WWE. Um, I don't know what a lot of directions that this could go. I I'm guessing that more than likely, Jon Stewart won't be doing a lot out in front of the crowd. I think that basically he'll be a backstage sort of correspondent, uh, maybe having a run-in with Seth Rollins before his big match. Um, but uh, we've seen uh, John Stewart kick Seth Rollins in the crotch before on Monday Night Raw, and uh, Seth Rollins never really get a lot of uh, revenge against him. But then again, WWE is kind of weird because when they have celebrities come into um, their WWE universe, normally it's like the celebrity will get over on uh, whoever it is that uh, they're fighting against. If you can remember against uh, Florida Georgia Line, the country singers, they were out doing uh, live uh, commentary and, and basically started getting into it with the wrestlers. You saw Florida Georgia Line lay out the wrestlers and basically just walk out and, uh, you know, just nothing really ever happened to them. You know, these guys are, are great country music singers. They make a lot of pop country that uh, sells a lot of records, gets a lot of plays on radio. But I don't think these guys are really in the gym training to be fighters all that much. It doesn't really make sense that they're just sort of, you know, low-blowing a guy and just walking off with no... Uh, no blows coming their way at the end of at the end of this. Um, there's a few different things that I think they could do with John Stewart. Um, basically, um, from my time watching The Daily Show, um, he has a little bit of uh, different views along with a uh, WWE Hall of Famer that would be Donald Trump. Um, I think that Donald Trump has not been announced for SummerSlam yet, and with him being a presidential candidate for, I believe, the Republican Party, uh, I don't pay a lot of attention to politics. I don't really talk about politics on uh, my channel all that much because it's just sort of a... It's either a hit or miss thing. You're either going to be on the same side of me or you're going to be on the completely different side and you're just going to want nothing to do with it. But uh, honestly, in my mind, I don't think Donald Trump will be president. I don't think that Donald Trump... Um, would make a good president, if, even if he was miraculously elected. But honestly, from listening to the things that, that Donald Trump said during the last debate, I think that a lot of what Donald Trump has in mind, um, he doesn't really say it the right way, 
Um, you know, he, like you said, he feels that in my, the United States of America today is, is too politically correct. Um, I, I think that you have to be a little bit politically correct in this world. And uh, you can't just go on and just basically blast the whole race. I understand that you want to cut off uh, the Mexican border. You don't want illegal immigrants coming into the country. But, you know, the, the lengths that he went to say this just went a little bit uh, too far in my mind. Um, definitely with, with sayings like that, you're going to get people behind you like, yeah. But then when you think about it at the end of the day, the people that are coming across uh, the Mexican border, um, the illegal immigrants, they're not really coming in and they're not taking uh, mainstream America jobs. A lot of these people work in like meat packing plants. They work on uh, farms uh, like picking strawberries or picking other things like that. They're doing jobs in America that a lot of Americans wouldn't do. Um, I have a problem with myself. I think that the, I think this is with every generation. They think the generation after them um, basically doesn't pick up the slack and run the country that they, they think they would run. I see a lot of people coming into the workplace these days that honestly don't give 100%. They're, they're very sluggish. And I'm sure that the people uh, that are that are older than me and saw me coming into the workplace with my generation probably thought the same thing. And it's like the, you know America is getting dumber and slower uh, as we move along. So there are things that Donald Trump says that I think does you know, I'm tired of losing as a country. Our dollar isn't worth anything. We're billions and billions of dollars in debt. Um, it makes no sense. Somebody has to pick up this country and put it in the right place. Um, you know, for, for so many years, we were looked at as one of the leading countries in the world. And it's not like we're a laughable joke. I mean, but we're, we're, we're in the elite top. But um, it feels like at the end of time, we're getting left behind. And uh, basically, there's, there's classes in America that don't really equal out to anything. There's like basically like you're rich or you're just scraping by and that's just about it. There's no there's no middle ground. These guys are getting richer. These people here are falling down more and more. But uh, I think that honestly, um, you know, the, the WWE, they had to do what they had to do with Hulk Hogan. You know, and he said what he said. Donald Trump said what he said. Donald Trump's not really getting blasted the way that he did. I mean, he didn't really drop any really big negative terms uh, about what he was talking about. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that Donald Trump is a guy that likes uh, the limelight. He likes people watching him. It doesn't matter if it's uh, you know wrestling fans or if it's anybody that's going to, you know, put uh, maybe a vote in his pocket. I think that Donald Trump would show up to SummerSlam if he was asked. Hell, I mean, he did the WWE Hall of Fame as a personal friendship um, to uh, Vince McMahon how these guys are friends it doesn't make sense to me um but you know they went out they, they promoted their show they went on the today show the, uh, the night after vince got his head shaved uh talking about how big of a success um uh, wrestlemania was um i wouldn't be surprised if, if john stewart and donald trump have some sort of show off uh, as a part of SummerSlam, I think it would be something that gets a little bit out there um, into you know the news world. Uh, would be showing clips of SummerSlam and that sort of like you know picking up the pace and trying to make this like a bigger WrestleMania. So we'll see what goes on with John Stewart. And uh, maybe at the end of the day, playing it safe, it's just him uh, maybe getting kicked in the nuts or maybe him getting the better of Seth Rollins again. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if Donald Trump, a WWE Hall of Famer, is a part of John Stewart being at SummerSlam this year. Since WrestleMania, honestly, you can look at Rusev's career and see that basically it's not going as great as it once was. But uh, Rusev, I think, is gaining a lot of popularity. A lot of people who thought that this guy was boring is, is starting to see that uh, there is a different side to him. I think that maybe it is one of the pluses that go along with Lana giving him the dump. Um, you know, along the way, basically, Rusev kept on losing to John Cena month after month at different pay-per-views. During this, basically, um, you know, he kept blaming Lana for the losses, whether if it was her uh, feather boa being inside of the ring or if her uh, getting inside of the ring. Or I think the final straw that broke the camel's back was uh, Rusev yelling, I quit, I quit, uh, during the I quit match to John Cena. Uh, Lana... Uh, you know, who is Rusev's lover at the time, basically getting into the ring, not wanting to see Rusev to tortured anymore, came in and yelled, I quit, which basically Rusev, uh, you know, was saying, you know, that it wasn't true. It wasn't true. Uh, basically, that is what left uh, Rusev in the doghouse heading down to the mid card from, you know, his battles with John Cena. Um, from there, 
basically the one thing that has really turned around for uh, uh, Rusev since being dumped by Lana is picking up Summer Rae. Summer Rae basically watched Rusev, a, a beaten and bruised man. Rusev uh, suffered an injury where he broke his foot, and uh, Summer was there to pick up the pieces and mend him back into being a uh, you know a big time brute uh, in the mid card for WWE. Um, during this time, Dolph Ziggler uh, picked up the pieces with Lana. Uh, they went on and they've taken you know pictures on Instagram and they're making out backstage and uh, they're trying to turn Lana into an all American girl. You can debate back and forth if you think uh, that Lana is going to be a big star. Um, I think WWE sees in Lana a a Sable, a Sunny, a Trish Stratus, somewhere along the way, um, you know, a big time um, pop culture a girl that's you know, a lot of views and bringing a lot of people. Honestly, I liked Lana and Rusev together. I think that Lana still could have, you know, taken bikini pictures and done interviews. Um, it's like what Dana White, what Dana White was saying. You know, basically, um, you know, wrestling is fake. These people play characters. It's not real fighting. I think this is understandable. I mean, Lana could do some podcast. She can do some interviews in cafe, but that's what the story calls for. But Lana easily could have been pushed out there as a sex symbol as well as being a you know Russian sympathizer who has this big Russian brute who's running through people inside of WWE. Um, since this breakup happened, uh, Rusev uh, isn't really the force that he once was. He lost the uh, United States Championship uh, to John Cena. Um, he's had losses to Cesaro as well as Roman Reigns. The guy that just seemed unbeatable um, is now actually finding losses on Monday Night Raw as well as SmackDown. Um, you know, when Lana, uh, you know, started doing the whole makeouts with Ziggler, it drove uh, Rusev crazy to the point where Rusev, um, you know, planned an attack on Ziggler where he came to the ring wearing his walking boot and bringing a crutch to the ring, uh, which he had been walking around in for a month or so. And uh, basically, it was time for Rusev to say that he was no longer hurt. And uh, he basically took and exposed Ziggler and beat him down. Uh, I think they said that the, uh, the injury was to Ziggler's throat and now that he's actually able to talk Ziggler has made his return on uh, Monday Night Raw this week where uh, Lana trapped Summer Rae and Rusev inside of the ring at the same time where uh, Rusev um, you know uh, you know walked into the ring after being slapped by uh, uh, Summer Rae it wasn't really easy to see if um, basically Russo was actually going to attack Lana or just be into the ring and, and, and try and be intimidating. Uh, but Lana looked over his shoulder and there was Dolph Ziggler running down to make the save attacking Russo. Uh, we saw super kicks from Lana and from Ziggler. In my mind, when I was thinking about Ziggler's return coming to SummerSlam, I thought this was going to be a mixed tag, but I guess there's word coming that... Um, the mixed tag is actually going to be next month. So basically, in my mind, I think this is going to be a match. This is basically going to get thrown out. As of right now, SummerSlam is, is four hours long. There's going to be a one-hour pre-show. There are ten matches on the card. Uh, nothing as of now has been named to be pre-show worthy. But honestly, in my opinion, it's either going to be this this uh, Ziggler versus Rusev match, or it's going to be the uh, uh, tag team match. It's going to get bumped. Definitely, in my mind, um, the, the Owens versus Cesaro, uh, when you look at the... Um, uh, Divas uh, mixed. I'm not. They're not a mixed tag. It's an elimination tag. That's about the future. That, that's about building. And I don't think you can bump either one of those. Plus, it's the only Divas match that's on the show. Um, easily, you look at this one. It might be the one that gets bumped. But uh, I'm guessing that more than likely, uh, Summer Rae and Lana are going to get involved in this match with one of their ECW style cat fights. Both of them jumping on each other, rolling around, pulling each other each other's hair. Um, Ziggler and uh, Rusev are trying to, you know, worry about breaking the woman's fight up to the point that they, 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 don't, they don't care about their own, or maybe there's just some sort of cheap roll-up along the way, which leads to the girls having to be involved next month at Night of Champions. So, we'll see where this one goes, but I'm guessing that we're going to be seeing this uh, combination of guys and girls at Night of Champions next month. I think this is going to be the best match of the night. Easily, in my mind, these guys are both hungry. Uh, we've seen these guys match up on Monday Night Raw. We've seen these guys match up on SmackDown. Uh, we've seen these guys battling over who was going to fight John Cena for the United States Championship. We've seen these guys battling for title shots against Seth Rollins. We've seen them mixed up in different tag matches. We've seen them mixed up in different three-way matches. We've seen them fight themselves. 
Easily, you can tell that Cesaro and Kevin Owens are both two of the biggest stars that are rising in WWE as of right now. Um, Cesaro is one of the guys that got knocked by uh, Vince McMahon during the Stone Cold Steve Austin podcast about guys coming up short when reaching for that brass ring. Easily, you can tell that Cesaro is a great wrestler. He's been a great wrestler dating back to his PWG and to his Ring of Honor days. He was easily one of those guys you can tell that was going to get picked to become a WWE guy and uh we thought that the road to becoming a star in WWE wouldn't take as long as it has. Um, he shot through NXT developmental, FCW, whatever you want to call it at the time. But um, it seems like he's just sort of got stuck. You know, different things that he's he's gone with have, have looked like they were going to work really great. He was doing the King of Swing. He was in the uh, All-American Tag Team with Jack Swagger that looked like it had um, you know future Tag Team Champions written all over it. He got into the Tag Team with him and Tyson Kidd where he actually they did win the tag titles and you know either through mishaps or just you know the writers dropping the ball or the injury to Tyson Kidd you know he hasn't found his way but easily you can tell that this last push that Cesaro has been on has been real um Kevin Owens is going to be having a big weekend SummerSlam weekend of course SummerSlam he's going to be wrestling at the NXT show in Brooklyn well I guess SummerSlam's in Brooklyn too uh but NXT TakeOver Brooklyn he's wrestling in the main event um against Finn Balor he's trying to get his NXT championship back in a ladder match so I mean that's that's pretty big you know there's a few wrestlers on this card uh Becky Lynch Charlotte Sasha Banks, Kevin Owens, they're all going to be wrestling twice. And for WWE, even if it is for their developmental brand, um, booking a guy on two big shows on back-to-back -back nights doesn't get done all that often. And you can tell that they really have faith in this guy stealing the show. And I believe this is the match where you can tell that Owens and Cesaro are for real. You know, they both had coming out appearances in the back. You know, Cesaro has won big matches. Of course, Kevin Owens is going to be remembered as being the guy who beat John Cena in his debut match at the Elimination Chamber. But, um... This is going to be really, really good. You know, basically, we've seen, um, you know, Kevin Owens. He's sort of that guy. He's he's not to that main event level, but, you know, his whole gimmick is that basically he is a prize fighter. He fights, um, you know, to get wins, to rise his stock in WWE, which gives a better life for him and his family at home. Um, we've seen him walk out on matches with uh, Cesaro, um, basically because he had other opportunities. It's like he is paid to show up big on the pay-per-views, and that's uh, you know what he saves himself the most for, um, to the point where you know Cesaro is called um, Kevin Owens, you know, basically saying that his fight Owens fight shirt should say "Walk Owens Walk." Um, definitely, you can tell that this is going to be the budding future of WWE. I think this is going to be the one match you can point your uh, finger to at the end of the night, saying this is probably the best match of the night. When it comes down to it, I I, I don't know if they're going to be able to say Kevin Owens loses both matches uh, of the weekend. I don't see him beating Finn Balor for the NXT Championship. He's a guy on the main level, um, on the main roster in WWE. Him carrying around the NXT title doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Um... So I don't see him winning the Finn Balor match. Um, but then I, I really think that Cesaro is the guy that's going to pull out the victory here at SummerSlam as well. As long as these guys are locked up together, we're going to be getting great guaranteed matches. So one way or another, I think that we're both going to be the winners. But to put your money on Cesaro, I think that's where the win's going to be. I will be the first to say that Sheamus versus Randy Orton at this year's WWE SummerSlam 2015 seems to be a match that we've seen... 2,000 times inside of WWE at various pay-per-views, Monday Night Raws, SmackDowns, this, that, or the other. I think most people will always remember Randy Orton versus Sheamus, the Monday Night Raw that was after WrestleMania 29, the one that basically the crowd just gave no fucks what was going on inside of the ring. Um, they started doing the, the wave, they started chanting for the announcers, they started chanting for various things that were inside of the arena. It just isn't a very sexy matchup of guys inside of the ring. As of right now, the big buildup of this match dates all the way back to Money in the Bank, where both of these guys were competing to try and get the title shot to go after um, you know, the champion whenever they get the chance. Everybody knows what the Money in the Bank briefcase represents. Sheamus ended up winning the match, and since then, Randy Orton has made it his number one goal in WWE to be taking out Sheamus any chance that they got. At the last pay-per-view, we see we saw these guys get into the ring. They had a very short, very good match. Um, you know, I believe it ended with uh, 
uh, Randy Orton evading the brogue kick, which led to uh, an RKO and a win for Randy Orton, getting the one, two, three. And, um, you know, everybody went home happy, and that was it. Since then, uh, Randy Orton ended up becoming the number one contender to the World Heavyweight Championship on Monday Night Raw due to the fact that John Cena was able to get, unable to compete due to his broken nose. Uh, Sheamus ended up breaking up Randy Orton's chance to beat Seth Rollins after delivering a uh, top rope RKO. Um, definitely, if Randy could have made the cover, it would have been over. Randy Orton would have been the new champion. Instead, Sheamus came down. He uh, displaced Randy Orton. Um, then he went for the brogue kick himself to try and get the 1-2-3 uh, count against Seth Rollins, cashing in the Money in the Bank. But as the referee was taking his time with the Money in the Bank briefcase, um, Randy Orton slipped into the ring, delivering an RKO to Sheamus, and Sheamus' dreams of becoming WWE World Heavyweight Champion uh, were laid to rest. Um, when I went to the uh, Stockton House show, I saw this as a, as a match. Um, it, it was a very good match. I'd probably say that the match was probably about seven to eight minutes. It was one of the first times that I ever watched Randy Orton, and I really liked him. And this is a discussion that I heard on Brian and Vinny. It might have been on Wrestling Observer with uh, Dave and Brian, but one way or another, I know I know Brian Alvarez was involved. They were talking about you know going to house shows and actually seeing Randy Orton work. Definitely people that watch Randy Orton work at house shows will tend to start to like Randy Orton. I think that's what's happening to me. Anybody who's talked to me about Randy Orton, I've just been able to say that this guy has never been one of my favorite guys. He's just been a guy. All of his matches seem the same. But in this last few weeks since going to that house show, I've, I've seen that I've been more attentive during Randy Orton matches, even to the point where I'm almost rooting for the guy. Um, he's one of the few guys that is in WWE where I've never bought a t-shirt. I've never done anything to really support this guy. And he's always been one of those guys on the, the VIP list where I've just looked at it and said, like, I have no care in ever meeting Randy Orton. And now I here I am basically on the verge of actually saying that I'm a fan. Uh, in this match, you have to go with the fact that, you know, Randy won the last match. So I'm guessing that Sheamus is going to get the win this time. But some people are actually thinking that Sheamus is going to be cashing in that Money in the Bank briefcase somewhere along the way. And Sheamus becoming World Heavyweight Champion and having a guy that has two straight victories with him being Randy Orton is pretty good at building a, uh, a match uh, in the future. So in this match, I'm going to take Randy Orton to get the win. I know it's hard to get back-to-back -back wins on, on pay-per-view, especially if you're a babyface especially when you're trying to build a future champion. But so many times that you've seen guys hold the Money in the Bank briefcase who just get to the point where they never win. But because they have that briefcase, a lot like if you, if you had the United States Championship or if you had the Intercontinental Championship, you could lose on SmackDown and Raw all you wanted because basically when you walked out the next time, you'd still be holding that belt, and that makes you a little bit more prestigious than everybody else that's on the show. But my pick, Orton to get the win over Sheamus. All right, in a returning bout from WWE Battleground 2015, we have the triple threat for the Intercontinental Championship. It's going to be your Intercontinental Champion Ryback going up against former champions The Big Show and The Miz. Uh, Ryback, to me, honestly, was sort of a surprise guy to win the Intercontinental Championship tournament. And uh, the IC belt has been on a little bit of a ride um, for you know about six months now, I guess you can say. Wade Barrett came down with an injury where he had to be stripped of the championship. Daniel Bryan won the title at WrestleMania 31, but due to an injury, he had to be stripped of it as well. Uh, last month, we had Ryback coming down with a staph infection in his leg. And um, I thought that uh, basically Ryback would be stripped as well. I don't know if WWE is not looking for any negative publicity on the Intercontinental title of it being some side of, some side of a, a curse. But for some reason, WWE wants this match to happen. I don't know if they want you to remember all of the buildup that went into the Miz TVs for Battleground 2015 or what happened. But to WWE's history, this match as a three-way is very important. It would have been very easy to put Big Show versus The Miz one-on-one -on -one at Battleground, have the winner crown the Intercontinental Championship, and then brought Ryback back this month for SummerSlam, having him returning and going after the championship in another three-way if they wanted this match to go down. Instead, The Miz and Big Show were both scrapped um, from Battleground. Uh, I, I don't believe either one... Uh, no, wait a minute. Big Show walked down to the ring and knocked out the Miz. Uh, they they had Miz, you know, basically talking on the mic about how Ryback 
um, was was avoiding um, you know uh, putting his Intercontinental Championship on the on the bout, and then when the Big Show came out, started running his mouth of being a bigger star, this that and the other, and Big Show knocked him out. Basically playing the babyface, you know, Big Show from week to week, maybe even from show to show, um, portrays himself as a babyface or a heel. His rank of uh, being a uh, uh, turning babyface or heel is off the charts in WWE. Um, and this one, he just seems to be the odd man out. I like the way that the Miz basically is sort of the um, anti antagonizer of this whole thing. It's like he wants Big Show and Ryback to go in there and beat the hell out of each other. And then basically be able to slide in at the end and just sort of beat up both guys. And uh, try and uh, pick apart uh, a victory out of this. But... Uh, I don't know, man. This is going to be a, a big match with a lot of power. I'm guessing that we're going to be seeing you know, the big uh, Ryback being able to, to pick up uh, Big Show over his head. Uh, and see, it's hard for me to pick a winner in this match because a part of me really wants The Miz to win this match and become Intercontinental Champion. But the smart person in me just thinks if they wanted to get the belt off of Ryback already, they would have done it at Battleground where they would have just stripped him and, and put the belt on either Big Show or Miz. They just wouldn't have been a little bit uh, ahead of schedule of what they were going to do. So honestly, the smart way out of this is just pick Ryback to get the win. Um, when you look at sh the show, SummerSlam honestly has 10 matches on there. There's only a few matches that can be slid down to the uh, pre-show. At this point, there's so many people featured on the card. I think it'd be impossible for WWE to put any kind of a match on the SummerSlam pre-show that anybody's going to care about. As of right now, Ryback, Miz, and the Big Show for the Intercontinental Championship is my lead pick to be bumped down to the WWE SummerSlam kickoff party. Um, sponsored by, of course, uh, Mountain Dew. Uh, what the hell is that energy drink that they that they have? Uh, whatever it's called. Um, that That's my guess about what's going to be there. Ryback, Miz, and Big Show. My pick, Ryback, to keep the Intercontinental Championship and uh, hopefully have a one-on-one -on -one match against Big Show or Miz at Night of Champions. Big tag team match uh, coming from WB at SummerSlam 2015. The tag team division never really finds a way um, to, to really become mainstream in uh, WB. But as of right now, the New Day with Kofi Kingston, Biggie Langston, and Xavier Woods, they are one of the top acts in WB as far as what people are talking about, what's buzzing, what's the highlight of Raw, what's the highlight of SmackDown. It's always what the New Day is coming up with. They, they were a really big hit on the Chris Jericho podcast, talking about the group coming together as a whole, how they became a team, you know, basically what the writing team thought of the team, what their uh, plans were uh, when they first got together, and, and where they are now. Um, you can think of a few months ago, uh, with uh, Biggie Langston and Xavier Woods at Money in the Bank, uh, defending the... Uh, uh, the tag team titles, as well as Kofi Kingston and the Money in the Bank uh, match itself. That's probably the highlight of the New Day, you know, being able to have a singles match as well as having a tag match defending the titles. I believe that the New Day, there is more life in them. And easily, I will start out the video by telling you they are my prediction to win this match. They have to win this match. It has to be able to get done. Um, when you look at who they're going against, the tag team titles are, are on uh, the primetime players as of right now, Titus O'Neil and Darren Young. Um, they're they're uh, acts that are behind them basically are the Matadors and the Lucha Dragons. I think that honestly, the Lucha Dragons are a future force in the tag team division with Hunico and with... Uh, no, I already fucked this up. It's Kalisto. Kalisto and uh, Sin Cara, who used to be Hunico. I think that these guys are really great wrestlers. They're a really great team. They bring a lot of high energy um, to their matches, whether if it's on SmackDown or whether if it's on Monday Night Raw. They're always a very, very fun tag team. They shot through NXT. They won the titles. They lost the titles. The next thing you know, they're debuting on Monday Night Raw um, the night after WrestleMania. You know, they didn't get a lot of fanfare about an NXT you know person being called up. But um, you know they're really gonna work if they if they stay in the tag team division. Hopefully they don't split these guys up in order to have this dream match of mask versus mask, which has been talked about since WrestleMania 27 of 
Rey Mysterio against uh, Sin Cara, which finally happened at Triple Mania at the main event of that show. Uh, I could see Vince McMahon, you know, basically having hard on at the uh, at the desk, thinking about what's going to happen at WrestleMania, and saying, "I know we'll split these guys up and put them against each other. We'll break that, you know, Los Angeles Dodger. No, it was it was the Angels." The uh, Los Angeles uh, Angels of Anaheim record of uh, most people wearing a mask in one place at one time. But uh, when you look at the Matadors, they're a great, dependable tag team. They always find a way to have good matches. I will honestly tell you that I don't even know what their names are as the Matadors. When they're in there, I just call them the Matadors. I still call them Epico and Primo. I still can't tell which one's Epico. I can't tell which one's Primo. Um... I think that they had big ideas a few years ago when this team came up of them, you know, bringing up the bull um, and uh, what the bull was going to be able to do. I mean, he has fun at house shows at that show I went to last month in Stockton. He was bouncing around the ring and the Matadors got eliminated pretty early during the match because one of them was talking to WWE security guard and forgot to pay attention to the match. Why this guy got rolled up for the pin. But, um, you know, from there, um, the Lucha Dragons and the Ascension continue to have a great tag team match. They had a lot of fun. But uh, definitely when it comes to SummerSlam here, we want some New Day. We want some New Day. New Day's got to get it done here. Primetime players are great champions. They should have been champions a long time ago. Primetime players Titus O'Neil and Darren Young were over at SummerSlam. I think it was 2013, and, and then you know somewhere along the way they got hurt, they got split up. Um, they thought Titus O'Neil was going to be a great single star, and he just became one of the dorks that was doing run-ins, trying to break up fights on Monday Night Raw. You can really tell your spot on the card if there's going to be a you know a, you know everybody out of the back trying to break up a fight inside of the ring, and you're one of the guys that WWE tells you to go out there. I know that like Kevin Owens and Sheamus. And Cesaro were the guys that were out there trying to break up the fight between Undertaker and uh, Brock Lesnar on Monday Night Raw a few weeks ago. But uh, you know, Titus was one of those dorks that was involved in like the main event of Monday Night Raw, the entire Raw roster against Randy Orton, something stupid like that. You want to make sure that you're not featured in that match if you're trying to become a star. But they didn't pull the trigger on Titus. They like the way he is. You know, he won the Father of the Year competition and things like that. But it's got to be New Day. New Day's getting the win. They're my pick. Another big tag team match from uh, the, the families, I guess you can say, of the WWE is the Wyatt family coming back together. Bray Wyatt and Luke Harper um, going up against uh, Dean Ambrose and Roman Reigns. The Shield versus the Wyatts. You go all the way back to 2013. Um, near the end of that year, these guys had a standoff where it was the Shield and the Wyatts three on three, ending out Monday Night Raw with these guys slugging it out and just battling out to see who the strongest trio of the group was. We'd have to wait all the way until Elimination Chamber 2014, which a lot of people look at as one of the matches of the year. Uh, Roman Reigns is the guy that didn't get the win at WrestleMania. Um, a lot of people were, were thinking that you know Roman Reigns was on this sort of uh, uh, you know we're gonna fix him kind of tour where he was just gonna build himself back up. I really looked at you know Roman Reigns being paired up with Bray Wyatt as a way to kill off Roman Reigns, kill off any of the momentum that this guy had made after WrestleMania. It seemed like by him losing the match with Seth Rollins cashing in on him and Brock Lesnar. It was almost like people gained a lot of respect for him because people thought that he was giving the the main event, the WWE Championship, um, everything handed to him on a silver platter. That he shot through WWE too fast, he hadn't paid his dues, he was too green, this, that, or the other. I'm a fan, I like this guy, I don't see what he hasn't done. Um, if the guy's going to be over, is if he's, if he's going to be the star of the future, he's going to be the star of the future. Why people are jumping on the bandwagon of this guy so fast, I have no idea. Because at, when he was a part of the Shield, he was like one of the most popular dudes in WWE that people were talking about and people were buzzing. But all of a sudden, the guy you know wins the Royal Rumble, The Rock shows up and helps the dude out in a fight against Rusev. Um, all of a sudden, he's going up against Brock Lesnar in the main event of, of WrestleMania, which seems pretty badass to me. This guy becomes the most hated guy in the world. I, I've got no clue. Um, there's no secret that this match isn't what it was supposed to be. At one time, it was being picked out to be a, uh, I guess you can say, a six-man tag with uh, Sting and another member of the Wyatts. It's been rumored if it was going to be um, 
I guess it was going to be either Bo Dallas, it was going to be Adam Rose, uh, maybe Eric Rowan would be returning from, I can't remember if it was a neck injury or if it was a shoulder injury, but one way or another, um, I was looking at Harper and Rowan when they got back together as a tag team before joining the Wyatts, um, that they were really building something along the way. You know, uh, Roman Reigns was in the Money in the Bank match. Uh, Bray Wyatt, who wasn't even in the match, uh, showed up and spoiled Roman's shot of grabbing the golden briefcase above the ring. When, when Roman was climbing up the ladder with no one left in the ring, the lights went out, the Bray Wyatt intro went off. When the lights came back up, Bray was standing inside of the ring, tipped over um, the the uh, the ladder. Roman ended up not being able to win the match, ended up going to Sheamus, and which led us to um, the last pay per view, Battleground, uh, where it was Roman Reigns against Bray Wyatt one on one. It looked like you know Roman had killed Bray, and out of nowhere, Luke Harper emerged wearing a sweatshirt throughout the crowd. And uh, from there, the Wyatts were reborn. On Monday Night Raw, they ran a uh, promo inside of the ring where I really thought they were going to be bringing somebody back to the Wyatts or maybe having somebody, you know, baptized into the group. It ended up being that they just talked for a long time. Uh, they did tell the story of the Wyatts, something that I've been looking to, to hear for a long time because of right now, it, it's always seemed like, uh, you know, they were a family, but it always seemed like uh, Bray Wyatt was a cult leader and he was bringing people into his shack inside of the woods and he was sort of brainwashing them to believing in the, in the thoughts where he would run the WWE and he would you know take over the world from there and um, he said that he found Luke Harper as they uh, bruised and broken man he healed him and uh, basically fixed him uh, and then what happened was he was set free that was always the plan where Luke Harper went on to you know win the Intercontinental Championship from Dolph Ziggler and he went on and he fought for um, you know, Team Authority at Survivor Series, but one thing or another, they ran out of ideas for Luke Harper, and he was brought back, and now he's with the Wyatts once again. We'll have to see if uh, Harper comes back and he rejoins the team, but uh, having a rebuilt uh, rebuilt Shield team of Ambrose and uh, Reigns, very strong for WB. They were looked at as one of the, the futures at WB, of course, Seth Rollins. When he broke up the shield, he went on to win the Money in the Bank briefcase, cashed in at WrestleMania 31, became the main eventer of WWE. You know, he's had a real strong championship run. Um, he's held the belt all the way since uh, late March. Um, so you can't go wrong with this guy, and I don't see him losing the championship anytime soon. If he's going to lose the title anytime, I think it's going to be at Hell in the Cell in October. I see him keeping the title um, through SummerSlam, through Night of Champions. Um, it's just it's just what I see coming down for the future. But uh, Wyatt's versus the Shield, easily in my mind. I'll take the Shield to beat the Wyatt's. Uh, Roman Reigns and Dean Ambrose, pretty badass to see these guys teaming together and uh, keeping it strong. Some people think that Ambrose might turn on Reigns. As of right now, it doesn't really make any sense. We haven't seen any dissension in these guys. They still seem like they're brothers who love to fight together and uh, you know love to hang out and bang chicks or whatever they do once the night's all over. Um, but uh, you know if Ambrose wanted something for maybe you know joining up with Rollins or just splitting up and going heel. I don't really see him joining the Wyatts. Nothing has really been shown in the cards. It doesn't really make any sense. If they're going to be doing a split, like when they did the Shield split, they're going to push it for like at least a month, maybe even two months before actually doing it because WWE is always behind on the blocks. They always make you wait way too long to the point where you don't really care. But then again, you know, people wanted the Shield to break up then all of a sudden they turned babyface. People didn't want the ride to end and when Rollins Rollins, um, you know, hit uh, Reigns in the back and then hit the uh, curb stomp on Ambrose. People were so shocked that it was one of the most memorable moments of the Shield being together. Last month, on the way to Battleground, the rumors started to run about Undertaker making a return as well as Sting making a return to WWE at SummerSlam 2015. It ended up going with Undertaker versus Brock in the main event, and it seems like Sting never got the call from WWE to be a part of uh, SummerSlam. I know that he is going to be a part of um, you know the SummerSlam Spectacular. They are bringing him in for an autograph signing um, SummerSlam week. I think it's taking place the day before SummerSlam. SummerSlam. It might be happening on Friday. I'm not 100% sure. I didn't look into it a lot because of the main reason I'm not going to SummerSlam this year. But uh, I think that honestly, the SummerSlam people, uh, the, the fans of this New York, New Jersey area, and Brooklyn, 
I think they're getting a little bit ripped off. I, I know that WWE is, is uh, charging a good little penny uh, for what they're calling meet and greets, and they are having a few things that are called panels, which I think are they're going to be shot for uh, WWE's network, and I think those are going to be good programming along the way. Last year, they had some uh, panels uh, which featured, featured DX, which was filmed and was put onto the network, but they also had... Uh, they, oh, they did the uh, they did the panel of um, shoot, what's it called? It was it was the uh, video game release uh, thing that that was uh, live on the network. But uh, they had um, Stone Cold Steve Austin, which I was at. They had Hulk Hogan. Um, they had a few of these panels. They're going to be doing those again this year, which I think will be WWE Network sort of exclusive uh, ways to see it, which I think that's pretty good. But honestly, they're not doing. SummerSlam access, which, you know, in LA was very cool, right outside of the Staples Center. They blocked off the street um, in between the mall and uh, the Staples Center, and they set up booths where you could buy merchandise, you could meet wrestlers, um, you could do certain things along the way, which was very fun, you know, especially if you were. You could come the day before. Saturday was an all-day event of access, but also if you were just coming to SummerSlam itself, um, you know, spend the extra fifty bucks, go into the Fan Fest, meet some wrestlers, and make it a whole day of it. We we're very, very fun. But it turns out that uh, they're not going to be doing a whole um, sort of ordeal for for access. If you look back at WrestleMania 29, I think one of the big disappointments for a lot of fans was WrestleMania access. They, you know, instead of uh, being put into a convention center where it's had a lot of success running for WrestleManias in the past. They ended up putting it inside of an arena uh, where basically you met the people. They were on the like the press boxes, I guess you can say. I wasn't there, so I'm not 100% sure, but I've watched videos and talked to my friends about it. And You ended up having to be in a line around the concourse um, throughout the, the place. They, they um, roped it off after a certain amount of people. Normally when you go to a WrestleMania access, if you go to one of the popular ones, you should honestly always be able to meet two people um, if not three per session. But uh, people were saying at WrestleMania Access that, you know, if you got two people, honestly, you were very lucky. And um, sometimes there were people that you really didn't really even care about meeting. And sometimes there were people where their line got blocked off immediately. And there was no chance in the world you were going to be meeting them there. But, uh, you know, if you buy these tickets, you're guaranteed to meet them. Sting's already going to be there. Uh, the rumor was for Sting that he was going to be a part of uh, the, the sixth man, uh, which would have been the Shield versus the Wyatts. The Shield. Uh, Sting would have, of course, been the newest uh, S.H.I.E.L.D. member. Somebody would have been added on the Wyatts, whether if it's Eric Rowan returning. I've heard rumors that he was actually at uh, the uh, Target Center in Minneapolis uh, at Monday Night Raw. Maybe they were going over the match. Maybe they were trying to plan something out. But um, my guess is that more than likely Sting will be a part of SummerSlam when it's all said and done. Dave Meltzer reported on Wrestling Observer Radio a few times uh, that Sting was given the call that he was going to be a part of SummerSlam. At the last minute, he was pulled out. Um, they ended up thinking that maybe Undertaker versus Brock was too strong. They didn't need Sting. Maybe some people say they're, they're saving Sting for another month. But as of right now, Sting is in ring shape. Sting's going to be in Brooklyn for the autograph signing. You might as well bring him in and have him do some sort of something at SummerSlam, whether if that's Eric Rowan jumping the rail, helping the Wyatts pull out the victory over the Shield, Sting coming down and, and saying like, hey, 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 I'm not letting this going down. How Sting fits into being a Shield member, how Sting fits into being um, against the Wyatts, why he cares that it's three on two against Ambrose and Reigns, I got no clue. That's for WWE to, to make up some story because as of right now, when you look at Undertaker versus Brock, Undertaker came back to avenge his loss at WrestleMania 30, making it seem that he had never been in WWE since WrestleMania 30. But we all saw him at WrestleMania 31. They're acting like that never happened. They're able to build this story around this. They can build a, a story around Sting returning and joining the Shield. So it's pretty easy. In my mind, I think Sting's going to be there. I think we're going to see him at SummerSlam. What do you guys think? I can honestly say about the next upcoming SummerSlam tag match, Stephen Amell against Neville against Stardust and King Barrett, I will honestly tell you that I am very surprised how much um, mainstream media attention that Stephen Amell has brought into uh, WWE. Honestly, in my mind, I don't know who this guy is. I've never seen the CW Arrow show. Uh, I'm not a real big superhero guy. I'm not a real big comic book guy. Um, if it's not Batman, if it's not um, Spider-Man, I don't really care for it. I always root for a good Superman movie to come out, but 
That last one that came out, uh, 2005 or whatever it was, that one was so bad. I don't care if I ever see Superman ever again uh, in my mind. But uh, Stephen Mell uh, has been a great guy to step into the ring for WWE. How they found this guy, how they figured out that he was a wrestling fan, how they were able to work their way into making this match for SummerSlam. Um, I, I have no clue, but I can honestly tell you that WWE has knocked it out of the park with this one. This is... Uh, if it would have been Neville versus uh, Stardust, if it would have been Neville versus Barrett, this is a match that nobody cares about. Um, this is the match that would easily be on the pre-show. Uh, nobody's ordering SummerSlam to see this, but basically um, you bring uh, Stephen Mell in, and now we have um, word that you know it, it's all over these uh, sort of uh, message boards talking about Arrow, all these uh, Steve Amell fans. This is a must-see match for them. Their guy is going into SummerSlam. These are network subscriptions. This is WWE thinking out of the box and knocking one out of the park. Even if these people only subscribe for one month and see this one match, they're going to be pushing that WWE network uh, number higher, which makes the network uh, more money, which makes WWE more money, which makes Vince McMahon more money, which in the long run, he turns around and gives us a better network with more shows because the things that are coming along are knocking it out of the park. Um, take the hat off to Steve Amell. I, I don't know who this guy is. If he walked into my bedroom right now um, and, and started talking to me, I, I wouldn't know who this guy was, and I'd be trying to push him out the door as fast as I could. But, um, you know, this guy's, I, I guess, been a lifelong wrestling fan and has always wanted to get into the ring. He's had his, ch his chance. He's it gone back and forth with him and Stardust on Twitter. Um, you know, he gets some retweets. He gets some attention for WWE. Honestly, it knocks it out of the park. When I think about this match, honestly, the one guy I think about is Neville. Uh, this is the, the match that's basically making this guy a star of this guy, you know, matter more than anything else. And this is one of Triple H's babies coming up out of NXT. You can remember when this guy was battling for NXT and then when he was NXT champion, people were talking about rumors about when this guy was going to debut, what his gimmick was going to be, and basically the word was coming out that Vince McMahon's idea for Neville was that he was going to be a Mighty Mouse character. I don't know. Uh, you know, basically that didn't really make sense at the time, but now looking at what you know, Neville is inside of WWE. The guy is Mighty Mouse, and it freaking works. I think what people were scared about is they thought about the Mighty Mouse cartoon, they thought about the name, and they thought they were actually going to be calling this guy Mighty Mouse. This is a guy that's, that's small, very agile, has a whole lot of moves, he's very built, he's very ripped, he's very strong, and, um, he pulls off being Mighty Mouse. They, they've given him basically the uh, nickname of the Red Arrow, which goes along with this finishing move. So that's good that he works alongside the Green Arrow right next to him and Steve Amell. And, this, you know, when you think about SummerSlam, they're trying to build this up like WrestleMania. And what built up WrestleMania in the past was, you know, having celebrity guests. If it's, you know, um, Mr. T, if it's, uh, you know, the Rockettes, if it's Muhammad Ali, Billy Martin... Um, Burt Reynolds, um, you know, the, the long list of names that have come on that have helped WWE, none other than bigger than Mike Tyson, I guess you can say, but Steve Amell, honestly, is a celebrity, is a guy that I wouldn't have picked to join WWE, and, you know, when the word was coming out, I honestly looked at it as like, this is no big deal, I mean, Stardust versus Steve Amell was one of the first matches that was being rumored for SummerSlam, it was one of those matches that people were talking about before anything else, we didn't know we were going to be getting Undertaker versus Brock, how Wade Barrett fits into this whole mix, I've got no clue. I, I don't know if this is late planning on WWE's part. Maybe they thought that Steve Amell wasn't going to be able to wrestle a one-on-one -on -one match. Maybe they wanted to have Neville be involved. Um, I've got no clue. Maybe they'd rather have Goldust, but Goldust is injured and uh, wasn't able to make the return. But it seemed like Wade Barrett was just picked out of a, a hat uh, to join into this. But uh, if it gets him, him any more mainstream attention, I'm all for it. I mean, he might even be the guy that's just picked out of the hat to be the guy who takes the fall out of this deal. Um, but uh, it puts more money because he's on a super, uh, the SummerSlam match. And I'm sure he'd be rather wrestling at SummerSlam rather than just sitting in the back not doing anything. 
Um, Steve Amell has already said that this is going to be a one-off for him. He's not in, uh, planned to be in any WWE events. He's not planning on becoming a full-time wrestler. But uh, as the word has gotten out, Steve Amell injured himself. Um, Brian Alvarez talked about it Monday Night Raw when he jumped into the ring. You can easily see his ankle buckle. Um, very lucky that the ankle didn't break, which would have killed this whole match and everything they've built to at this point. Uh, also, he, he announced on Facebook during a live video that he had... Um, um, cracked his mouth pretty good um, and wasn't really able to talk which I'm sure was going to piss off the people because he was going to shoot Arrow that day. Um, he was doing some sort of a lift with some weights. Uh, he was so anxious to get into his workout um, that he ended up picking the weights up and the weights smacked him right in the mouth, which broke a molar. He bit his tongue. Uh, his tongue swelled up, and so you know he was probably messed up for a couple of days there. But uh, it honestly really does surprise me that Steve Amell is into the gym, getting into the you know the great perfect shape that he's going to be in for this match. Easily, you got to pick him. Mel and Neville to get the win in this match. I don't really see this one coming anyway, but like I said earlier in the beginning part of this video, take my hat off to Stephen Amell, take my hat off to WWE. This is a celebrity interest inside WWE that really has um, exceeded my expectations. Um, definitely, I'm hoping that, that he brings in some fans that actually buy the network, don't find some sort of a stream or get waiting for, to see this on Access Hollywood or on ESPN. They actually, you know, buy the show to see the show live and see the actual match and See what this guy can do. My hat's off to him. I wish him all the luck. I'm picking him to get the win. Emil and Neville to beat Stardust and King Barrett. It's time for a revolution. It's time for the Divas Revolution. Basically, they have a huge match at SummerSlam 2015. I think when everybody saw the Divas debuting, when we had the debut of Monday Night Raw, Sasha Banks, Charlotte, and Becky Lynch, all at the same time when Stephanie McMahon brought them out, I think everybody knew that they were building to some sort of a gang warfare like they're getting right here at SummerSlam 2015. We've got Team Bella, we've got Team Bad, and we've got Team PCB. Everybody knows about the uh, submission sorority name that uh, Paige, um, uh, Becky, and uh, Charlotte had for one week before basically word got back to WWE that someone had already staked claim to the submission sorority name, and uh, it was bad publicity for WWE. How they don't run these people's names uh, that they come up with through some sort of a... Uh, Google or uh, anything to figure out what's going on. I have no clue. Uh, I don't know if it was a big surprise to them about uh, CJ Parker. Um, of course, that was Pamela Anderson's name on Baywatch back in the day. I don't know if that was planned or if that just was something that snuck through the cracks. Uh, and then they ended up coming up with that. But uh, or was it? It was CJ, right? It wasn't PJ. Whatever it was, I heard the guy just gave up wrestling. Uh, he retired and he's moving into a different field. So my hat's off to that guy. Um, I really wished him the best of luck when he left NXT after the Kevin Owens match. And uh, he said that he was going to go out and he was going to show the world how good of a wrestler he was. And uh, I guess he uh, found other interests uh, to do outside of WWE. Um, but in this match, um, I, this is going to be a good one. I mean, Nikki Bella is closing in on becoming the longest reigning uh, champion of all time, even though she hasn't really been defending the belt um, in the past few weeks because of this whole Divas revolution. Uh, we've seen her lose matches to Charlotte. We've seen her lose matches to Sasha Banks. Um, and here we are in another non-championship match as well. Hopefully this is able to crown some sort of a number one contender. Maybe we can find out who the true leaders of these groups are. When I look at, you know, PCB, you know, Paige comes first. She's the veteran. She easily looks like, you know, she's the leader of her team. Uh, when you look at um, Team Bad, sometimes it's Naomi, sometimes it's Sasha. Um, you know, both of these girls, the cream rises to the top, and I think Sasha is going to be the leader over time. Tamina is easily the, the weakest link of this whole match, but this is going to be a good one. When the, the word came down, this was going to be a elimination tag match. I thought this was a match that uh, was going to be some sort of a joke, because when you have nine girls, uh, if it comes down to one sole survivor, when the longest possible match is that we have eight falls. And when you have an eight falls divas match, like we've, we've had with Survivor Series matches in the past, it ends up just turning into a, uh, you know, a, uh, a finisher fest where you know a girl hits her finisher gets a victory walks and turns around and gets hit with somebody else's finisher and it's just pin after pin after pin and it is sort of 
fun to see that many finishers in a row, but uh, when it's inside of a match and the girl's fresh and she gets it with one move, it just sort of takes you out of what is going on. I think that honestly, when it comes down to this, you know, I've seen, um, you know, PCB, they've been getting a lot of wins on Raw and SmackDown. I've been seeing, you know, Team Bad, they got the, the victory over Nikki. Um, you know, the, the Bellas right now, I know that they're the champions. I know that Nikki gets to walk out with the belt week after week, but it seems like they're just getting kicked around in the dirt. So I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, that this is the way of them, you know, sort of giving it to Nikki for becoming the longest reigning Divas champion of all time. I think that she's 20 days away or something close to that. So I don't really see her losing the championship if it's not on an actual pay-per-view like Night of Champions. So it looks like that she's going to take the reign of AJ. Some people say that's a knock on CM Punk. Some people say, some people say it's a knock on um, on AJ herself. I think it just it just happened. It just is what it is. You can tell when they brought these girls up, maybe it wasn't exactly what they had in mind. I think that maybe most people thought organically Sasha, Charlotte, and Becky um, were going to be brought up one by one, but bringing them up all at one time really did change the face of the Divas division. I know there's been word Sasha Banks in an interview where she basically was told by uh, the agents in the back producers, whatever you want to call them, that uh, she needs to start wrestling like a diva instead of wrestling like a, uh, a wrestler, I guess you can say. I hope they don't change these girls because honestly, maybe you have to st change your style if you get into the ring with a uh, um, one of the girls who don't really work all that well, Alana or a Summer Rae, um, not to really pick on anybody, but uh, I think that, you know, what's really got them to the peak is, is being a wrestler. You know, Becky Lynch, um, Paige, Charlotte, these girls know how to work. They they know how to great have great matches. And um, you know Na Naomi's one hell of an athlete. The Bellas have have been really improved. Alicia Fox has been a staple of the roster for a long time. Tamina is Tamina, but um, you know I, I'm really pumped about what's been going on with the Divas division. If you look at Monday Night Raw, we had a great match of uh, you know Becky Lynch was in there. Then we had the Sasha versus Nikki match. Every every week we have some sort of a different combination of things going down, and maybe one way or another we find some way to uh, have a tournament to determine the number one contender. We actually get to see a Charlotte wrestle a Becky inside of WWE. I don't know if they're saving that for somewhere down the road, but you know these alliances have to have matches. I'm not saying that they have to break up, but uh, you know like you know with DX, Shawn Michaels wrestled. Uh, Triple H, yeah, you know, Shawn Michaels, no, not Shawn Michaels, it was X-Pac against Triple H. They had matches because they had to improve their ranking inside of WWE. You know, I think they fought in an Intercontinental Championship tournament once on Monday Night Raw. It's just what you have to do sometimes to find out, you know, what they're doing. At the end of the day, you're friends, but you got a job, and that job is trying to become champion. So maybe we can do some sort of thing to switch this up. I want to pick... PCB in this match, Paige, uh, Charlotte, and Becky Lynch, because of the fact that they've been they've been going so strong as of late. But honestly, I think I talked myself into picking the Bellas for the fact that they really haven't won a lot of matches um, as of late. So maybe they'll get the one at SummerSlam to pick this team up out of the dirt. WWE World Heavyweight Championship time. This is the co-main event of WWE SummerSlam 2015. Of course, this is Seth Rollins versus John Cena. Champion versus champion. Both guys are going to be walking into this match um, holding championships. Uh, John Cena, of course, being the United States champion. And one guy is supposedly going to walk out with both championships around his waist. Or, in John Cena's case... Both championships draped around his neck. If we go back to him winning the titles at uh, Money in the Bank, of course, that Virginia Bryan and his injury after WrestleMania 30, he was forced to stri be stripped of the championship. The belts got put on the uh, the Money in the Bank uh, ladder match, and um, Cena ended up walking out. He ended up having to play the part that Daniel Bryan was supposed to play at Survivor Series, going up against Brock Lesnar. You know, it was the last time that John Cena held the championship before being beat at last year's Summer slam. Here he is having a chance to go after it one more time. Cena had a promo on Monday Night Raw basically saying that he was at the point of his career where he thought he was never going to get a championship shot once again. But when the opportunity came a knocking with Seth Rollins challenging him, he jumped all over it. Honestly, in my mind, John Cena feels like he's been involved in WWE 
for a long time. This guy is very rarely injured. Um, he's he's always been the, at the the main events deal. I think that's one of the reasons why the guy suffers so much hate um, throughout his career. But uh, honestly, you know. When I think about, you know, WrestleMania and John Cena, he made his first appearance at WrestleMania 19 in Seattle doing the wrap-off on the pre-show uh, when they weren't able to, to book uh, Ludacris, Jay-Z, Eminem, um, uh, uh, Fabulous, Famous, whatever, whatever that other guy's name was that had those two songs that were good and then disappeared forever. Honestly, in my mind... You know, it's not hard for me to think about, you know, WrestleMania 39 and John Cena being on that show. I know that John Cena is reaching out. You know, he's been in a few movies. He's been in back-to-back -back Judd Apatow movies. And um, people are saying that he's getting a lot of buzz in Hollywood as of right now. But I think that John Cena knows that wrestling is what butters his bread. And I don't think he wants to be The Rock. You know, he'd be very hypocritical if that's what he ended up doing. If you go back to the build for WrestleMania 28... Um, John Cena was really calling out The Rock for basically packing up his bags and leaving and not being a part of uh, WWE. You know, he came back to be the host of WrestleMania 27. It was challenged for him to be at WrestleMania 28, but, you know, he made an appearance on Monday Night Raw. He wrestled at Survivor Series. There were long, huge gaps when The Rock was not around, and I don't think John Cena wants to be that guy. He accepted the role that Vince McMahon gave him of basically moving back a little bit on the card, becoming United States champion but here they are in a rut trying to make SummerSlam be a big show they pulled John Cena's number he's in the main event so honestly in my mind we didn't really get the build that I don't think the writers wrote down on paper for Rollins versus Cena maybe it ended up being better maybe it ended up not being as strong as it once was but honestly if it wasn't for that United States Championship challenge match where Seth Rollins reached out with his knee and broke John Cena's nose I don't think we would be going into SummerSlam with the, as much buzz as we are Cena ended up having to take a few weeks off uh, he made his return on Tough Enough instead of being on, on Monday Night Raw which in my mind hurt it just a little bit where he accepted uh, Seth Rollins' challenge to go champion versus champion, belt versus belt, um, and, uh, you know, it is what it is. Daniel Bryan had to talk John Cena in, into taking the match, but when it comes down to it, John Cena and Seth Rollins are both great wrestlers. They're both going to deliver us a great main event. Um, I don't know, man. I don't think Cena's anywhere near slowing down. I don't think that he's going to be leaving uh, WWE anytime soon, but... At the same time, I don't really see a belt changing place. I don't see Rollins beating Cena. I don't be. I don't see Cena beating Rollins. I don't know if it's some sort of outside interference, whether if it's um, Sheamus, whether if it's The Rock, whether if it's Sting, whether if it's Triple H, Stephanie, Batista, Kane. Uh, there's so many names that you could throw out here about you know what's going down. Basically, word was out on the street that Kane was due to return on Monday Night Raw. The last time we saw him, Brock Lesnar had broke his leg. Seth Rollins, after the uh, steel steps from Brock Lesnar, where it broke the leg, went over and attacked Kane some more, adding more insult to injury. So if Kane was to come back, was he going to uh, you know, play into the Undertaker versus Brock storyline, going after Brock Lesnar and defending his brother? Was he going to go after his former boss? Um, and I don't know if he was really the boss, because I think they portrayed... Kane is more being the, the boss of the authority, but just he kept screwing up and couldn't get the job done. Um, well, you know, co workers, whatever you want to call it, the, the uh, guy that was inside the same faction with each other, was, there, was he going to go after Rollins? Um, but like I said, there's a thousand things that could break this matchup to giving them, um, it, it, putting them in different directions. But honestly, when it comes down to it, you look at Rollins, you look at Cena. I think what they do with SummerSlam matches so long is that basically they start feuds here and they go with the WWE plan of we're going to make this last three months. Night of Champions, we have another nine finish. And then what do you know what comes up in October? Hell in the Cell. You need to have a main event. John Cena versus Seth Rollins. WWE Championship on the line. Hell in the Cell. That draws attention. That's a big match. Uh, that's something that people are really going to care about. So uh, I think that, that basically we're not getting a finish. I think I don't think that Rollins is going to win. I don't think that Cena is going to win. I think the United States Open Challenge on Monday Night Raw and SmackDown is going to continue. And um, you know I don't think we're going to be see a, a winner in this feud for months to come. Like I said about the Cena versus Rollins match is that basically I don't think there's going to be a winner. I think there should be some sort of 
outside interference, something that breaks up this match, something that takes it out of its element and makes it something different. That way, we're seen as going to keep his United States Championship. Rollins is going to keep his World Heavyweight Championship, and the feud is going to continue into something else. One of the rumors that's being thrown around is that a lot of people think that Sheamus is going to be coming in and breaking up this match in order to cash in and become the Money in the Bank, you know, Mr. Money in the Bank champion, where he cashes in his, his briefcase, you know, beats Seth Rollins, ends up becoming champion. Hell, like we saw at uh, WrestleMania 31, he could uh, break into this match, making it a three-way, and he could even beat Cena to become the champion, and Rollins wouldn't even have to lose uh, because he changed the rules and made it a three-way, something that I don't even know if that was really legal. Honestly, in my mind, it reminds me a lot of what uh, Hernandez did in, in uh, TNA when he was the Feaster Fire champion and uh, decided to add himself into a five-way match for the championship, making it a six-way, only to get beat up by Eric Young and lose his Feaster Fire thing. I always thought that Hernandez was going to become like champion and was going to become more than he was, but uh, I think that was the writing on the wall that uh, TNA wasn't going to be pushing uh, Hernandez to the moon, um, you know, putting him into a feud, losing the Feast or Fire deal, and, and going into a feud with Eric Young. But uh, Sheamus is a guy that's been champion in the past. He's, of course, he's beat John Cena at TLC um, when Cena slipped off a banana peel on the top rope, crashing through a table and uh, making himself the champion. And then, of course, during the Nexus run, um, basically during a cage match, Nexus came down, helped Sheamus win. Um, his match, and uh, since then he became world heavyweight champion. Of course, at WrestleMania 28, he uh, beat Daniel Bryan in a matter of seconds, and he's probably held that belt somewhere along the line where he lost it and he picked it up again. So, Sheamus has uh, has been a guy where um, he has, um, you know, he, he's been at the top. He's he, even though he's a champion, he's, he's he would have been a lesser of a guy. But um, it is what it is. I don't really see Sheamus is cashing in. I think, honestly, he's one of the guys that was hurt the most by the uh, WWE getting rid of the World Heavyweight Championship, merging it together, uh, having both titles become one. Because you, you used to be able to have the, you know, the WWE Championship, which everybody knew was number one. The guy that was holding that belt was the top dog in the, um, in the company. And then the one... Um, that, that World Heavyweight Championship was sort of the guy that they were sort of keeping on top. He, he was the easy number two. He was the leader of SmackDown, and uh, it is what it is. I think that Sheamus is a great guy. There's been rumors in the past that you know, Vince McMahon thinking that Sheamus was going to be the John Cena of the company, the guy that was going to, you know, Cena was going to pass the torch to and become the number one babyface, and everybody was going to come to the matches to see Sheamus. And I just don't see him as that guy. I don't really see him as a good babyface. I don't really see the guy as a good heel. Um, He's a great wrestler. He has great matches. He's one of those guys that's going to go out there and hit the other guy as hard as he can. Um, I'm ho When Sheamus won the Money in the Bank briefcase at the Money in the Bank pay-per-view, I was ne negative on it at that point. I didn't think that he was going to be a good guy um, that, that could take care of the opportunity to be cashed in and become champion. So I don't really see him as the guy that's going to be cashing in at SummerSlam. I think that this feud between Cena and Rollins is going to go on for a while. And him you know, coming down to the ring to cash in is only going to re re result in him losing. I would love to see the point where somebody cashes in and the match is stopped due to disqualification uh, or just something stupid due, due to technicality. And then we just have some guy as a big idiot um, that cashed in and did it. You know, when, when uh, Cena did it, it was a run-in from the big show, which I think led to CM Punk still pinning... Um, Cena, but um, we'll see. And some people think that Sheamus is really going to do it. What do you guys think? I don't think he's becoming champion at SummerSlam. When you look at how big SummerSlam has grown, basically, you know, over a year uh, from what it was at the Staples Center to what it is at the Barclays Center this year, the one thing in WWE that puts it over the top is The Rock. I mean, this guy is the most famous guy in the world as of right now. He's making the best action movies in the world. Every once in a while, he graces with his appearance, whether if it's at WrestleMania or a random house show like what he did in Boston or a Monday Night Raw like he did in Barclay uh, about, about a about a year ago or so. I can't remember when you know, the Rusev thing happened, but uh, there was talk about basically maybe thinking of getting Rusev against The Rock at WrestleMania 31. 
how, how, how dumb were we? <laughs> but, um, you know, one thing or another, um, I think The Rock is going to be a part of SummerSlam 2015. Um, there's a lot of rumors going around out there about The Rock being there. He won't answer the question straight out, but a lot of it is based off of the Roman Reigns interview, where I think that basically he would have got screamed at by uh, Vince McMahon for putting this kind of attention on SummerSlam if it's for the wrong reasons, if uh, The Rock isn't going to be there. Normally, Vince doesn't like to, you know, inch towards uh, something that's not, you know, possible of happening. Uh, maybe it's it's out there that maybe The Rock, you know, um, you know, is, is putting feelers out there. Maybe Vince is trying to put feelers out there for The Rock as well. But um, if you think about, you know, the Royal Rumble in Philadelphia, which is a, a rowdy crowd like uh, like Brooklyn is, um, you know, it didn't really go that well for The Rock. So I, I honestly was really surprised that he would show up at WrestleMania 31. I know that the boos were more for Roman than it was for The Rock. And at WrestleMania 31, of course, he was going to be out there with Triple H and Stephanie and Ronda Rousey. So, you know, it's easy babyface material there for you. But you could tell that The Rock was pretty upset. Uh, and he basically took the rest of the night off when he did the uh, WWE Network um, exclusive backstage segment uh, with uh, Roman Reigns talking about winning the thing. You can definitely tell that he was in joke mode. He really wasn't caring about what was going on. He was making jokes with the cameraman. He was making jokes with the fans that somehow walked onto the set where they were shooting this backstage deal. Um, but <laughs> and he, uh, basically, even Roman Reigns, they, nobody cared about what was going on. They knew, they knew that the night was a joke. Um, you know, Roman won. He was booed out of the building. And um, they got where they wanted to, with Roman becoming the number one contender at WrestleMania 31. Um, but uh, it, it didn't really get over um, what they were trying to push down their throats. But uh, I know that a lot of people are thinking that The Rock is going to be a part of WrestleMania 32. Um, you know, when they had The uh, the Rock do the Monday Night Raw thing with Rusev and he showed up, they thought they, they showed, or they, they shot a backstage segment between him and Triple H with them sort of challenging each other without challenging each other, talking about, you know, the next time that they, they fought if it was going to happen, was going to be in, in front of a big, huge stadium that was going to have 100,000 people in it. Wink, wink. Talking about Dallas Stadium. We're talking about AT&T Stadium, the home of the Dallas Cowboys, WrestleMania 32. Um, I, I think that, honestly, you can look at them putting the building blocks of this together. WrestleMania 31 was them putting the first block down um, with Rock showing up, Ronda Rousey being in the front row, um, uh, basically, Ronda attacking Stephanie um, after uh, Stephanie had slapped The Rock in the face. Triple H just standing there like a goof, not knowing what to do. Here we are putting you know the second douse of fire onto this match. Out of the middle of nowhere, um, Seth Rollins is champion. You know, he's back in the good graces of the authority. You know, Triple H and Stephanie, um, they've never really dumped Seth Rollins publicly. But uh, they haven't really been together on television in a while. I don't know if that's because Seth Rollins has been able to stand on his own. And, uh, you know, if he's able to get hated, they, they don't need Stephanie and Triple H there to rub it in a little bit more. Um, but uh, basically, over the last few weeks, Triple H and Stephanie have been coming out uh, with Rollins. You know, on Monday Night Raw this week, they came out there and they basically portrayed him as one of the greatest champions of all time. Uh, they told Rollins that if he won his match against John Cena at WWE Survivor Series and it became the double champion holding both belts, they would you know, get a WWE golden statue um, for the uh, WWE headquarters in Stanford of, of Seth Rollins, basically like they have the ultimate warrior, like they have of uh, Bruno San Martino, like they have of Andre the Giant. Um, you know, they would, they would build one of these deals, but, uh, I think that honestly what the plan is as of right now is for, um, uh, Stephanie and for Triple H to get involved in the Cena versus Rollins match. At that point, the rock would emerge. He is coming out to break up, uh, what Triple H's plan is, uh, from there, maybe the match gets thrown out. Everybody's going so crazy. They don't even realize they didn't get a finish to this match. Um, you know, basically, Triple H is going to be furious that he wasn't able to pull one off and Rollins to get the victory, even though at the end of the day, Rollins would keep the WWE World Heavyweight Championship, which should have been his plan in the long run, but he wouldn't get the win of the factor. Um, and then you you know build towards Triple H versus The Rock 
at um, uh, WrestleMania 32. I know that there's talks of uh, Ronda Rousey being involved in this somehow, and some people think that Ronda Rousey will be involved in the Hell in the Cell pay-per-view, which is in uh, Los Angeles, um, where she uh, sets up her home base, and she's at a lot of the PWG as well as WWE shows that are shown there when she's not in training. Um, and that will be the next brick that adds towards uh, WrestleMania 32. But uh, I think The Rock's going to be there. I think The Rock's going to be involved in this World Heavyweight Championship. Cena versus Rollins match. What do you guys think? It's right up around the corner. Let's get this done. I remember when the rumors were coming out the week of WWE Battleground 2015 that The Undertaker was going to make an appearance at Battleground. And in my mind, I had no clue what Undertaker would be showing up for. Was he just building towards WrestleMania 32? Uh, was he going to be you know, featured in some sort of the match? Um, and people were throwing out the, the, the fact that Undertaker was going to be involved in the Brock Lesnar versus Seth Rollins match. I thought, no way in the world they're going to be doing this. This is way too far out from WrestleMania 32 to be, start building towards Undertaker versus Brock Lesnar one more time for the WrestleMania streak. Uh, Undertaker trying to avenge his loss. And what do you know? Main event time, we're seeing Brock Lesnar kill Seth Rollins. The gong goes off. I knew it was going to happen, and I still was surprised. Um, Undertaker appears. He hits the tombstone on Brock Lesnar. Brock Lesnar loses his shot of going after the uh, World Heavyweight Championship. Of course, because they're trying to keep Brock as strong as possible, the referee and Seth Rollins disappear. It ends up being all about Undertaker versus Brock Lesnar and their show-off. Undertaker shows up the next night on Monday Night Raw, challenging Brock Lesnar to a match at SummerSlam. The match... That's too big for WrestleMania. It's being held at Wrestle I'm sorry, at WWE SummerSlam 2015. Not the first time that I've made that mistake during today's show here. I'm trying to call this WrestleMania, but that is what they're really trying to get this down to. They're trying to make um, SummerSlam as big as WrestleMania. Trying to have two big travel events for wrestling fans to go to. Um, if if they're able to turn you know uh, SummerSlam into a bigger event than it already is, hats off to them because. Uh, I'm all for it. You know, who's not going to want the biggest party of the summer to knock it out of the park? Uh, for years, SummerSlam has always been looked at as the number two pay-per-view. Some years, they don't really build the best undercard. But when you look at this, Undertaker versus Brock as the main event is really delivered. Uh, when they had their show off on Monday Night Raw with these two guys beating the hell out of each other, even with about 25 other superstars inside of the ring, trying to keep them from fighting, um... You know, they basically made it the match that everyone in the world had to see, and they weren't going to wait to see it. But uh, it's finally here. You know, Undertaker came out during Monday Night Raw, kicked Brock Lesnar right in the balls, gave him the tombstone yet once again. You know, what are they building towards? Are they just trying to have a big match for SummerSlam, just trying to kick this number up, trying to get some more network subscribers? It's the biggest match that they could think of. I don't know why you're not doing Cena versus Undertaker. It's one of the matches that people have wanted to see for years. I've wanted to see it at WrestleMania, trying to have Cena in the streak, but uh, they never gave it to us, and it looks like we're never going to see that match unless you go back and watch the 2002 match, uh, which Cena wasn't even seen at that point. He, of course, he was wrestling as John Cena, but he wasn't the, the megastar uh, that he is today. So, um, I'm not sure. I mean, when you look at the drawing board, you got to think of what they're trying to get towards. Some people think that Brock is going to be Taker. Um, that way it sets up the WrestleMania 32 match. I, I don't know, man. Taker loses two matches. He loses WrestleMania 30. He loses SummerSlam 2015. And now he shows up again in January. And he starts asking Brock Lesnar for one more match. I'm, I'm looking at, like, Shawn Michaels and Undertaker. I think that maybe you ask for one more match, but no way in the world you get two out of this. Um, you have to have some sort of a finish. You have Bray Wyatt emerge from hell um, coming in, and he costs the Undertaker the match. Somebody costs Brock the match, and Undertaker gets a cheap victory. He doesn't feel like it's a, you know, he really earned it, so that way he challenges Brock to go at it one more time because... They're tied one-to-one, -one, even though he doesn't really feel like he really deserved it. Uh, he wants to beat him on his own. Hell, I mean, I, I will tell you the truth. I'm being 100% selfish. I want the uh, the WWE Hall of Fame to mean something. I can't really think of a lot of guys that could go in as the main eventer. I think it's too early for The Rock. He's still basically a part of the main roster. We're still thinking of him as wrestling at WrestleMania's. 
I wouldn't mind seeing Undertaker lose the match and go into the Hall of Fame at WrestleMania 32 in Dallas. It's something that we've been looking forward to for a long time. A lot of people thought that WrestleMania 32 was going to be Undertaker's uh, retirement match anyways. It doesn't really make sense for Undertaker to go into the Hall of Fame in Minneapolis or Orlando. Wherever you know uh, WrestleMania 33 is going to take place because we're still rumored uh, about where it's going to take place and, and I guess when they name 33 they're going to name 34 as well that's the way they did 31 and 32 and they named Santa Clara and Dallas but uh, I've heard Boston I've heard Detroit I've heard various other ones but uh, how can Detroit be able to you know bring in a Super Bowl bring in Wrestlemania and not be able to fix that city up it doesn't really make any sense why they're trying to bring in all these people if they're bringing in all this revenue in the city why are they not pouring it back into the city and people have seen the pictures of what Detroit is um, it's still a big city in the United States but uh, this is the you know, town that got torn apart um, by basically losing Ford by losing all of the uh, the car plants that were there um, sad, sad story. But why do we even start talking about that? We're talking about Undertaker versus Brock, baby. Um, I don't know. I, I don't see any way in the world Taker wins this match. My money's on Brock. I think it's a lock. Um, Undertaker's got the, the ups on Brock at, uh, Battleground. He got the ups on the go-home show to Monday Night Raw. I guess neither one got the victory when they were fighting inside of the ring. You know, Brock yelled at Taker, I'm going to kill you. Taker yelled, I'm going to have, uh, uh, you're going to have to. It seems like, you know, Undertaker is just a mortal man, just like me and you. Um, you know, it was funny when I was watching, uh, I think it was The List the other day, and they were talking about Undertaker, you know, coming out and, and wrestling as the biker Undertaker, big, bad, evil, whatever you want to call him. I always called him Biker Taker at that time. And, you know, it, it sort of exposed, you know, what you thought about Undertaker. You know, is this a real guy? Does he have a house? Does he go grocery shopping? Uh, what does this guy do in his real life? Um, I think that's the way he is right now. When I look at him, I see Dirty Harry. I see an older Clint Eastwood. I see that guy from uh, Gran Torino holding down the block, not letting, you know, big bad Brock Lesnar run his yard. Um, you know, Undertaker's been that guy who's always deserved respect, and uh, he might have to beat, beat it into Brock. But I don't see Brock Lesnar winning this match against Taker. I don't think there's a way in the world that it's going to happen. So... That's my views. That's my uh, spec uh, speculation on everything that's the uh, SummerSlam 2015. Let me know what you guys think. Who's winning this main event? Who's winning the other matches? Get back to me. At Stevie Breach on Twitter. Peace out, everybody.